Welcome to the Full Story series, where we take some of our older videos and put them together into a long audio drama of some of your favorite comic books, creating almost like a motion comic movie. Today, we're going to be telling you the full story of Thor the God Butcher, where a lot of things happen. He travels through time and battles against one of his craziest enemies. This is also a prelude to some of the events that lead up to War of the Realm, so it may help you to some extent. Hope you guys enjoy, and don't forget, if you do enjoy this, consider giving this video a like and subscribing to our channel. I'll tell you again at the end of the video, but it's kind of long, so I wanted to tell you at the beginning. Enjoy. Our story begins in 893, just off the coast of Iceland, where a young Thor enjoys the finer pleasures of his life. A frost giant has been terrorizing the people for weeks, and Thor saw to it that his axe Jornbjorn would hack off his head right there. For the next four days, Thor had eaten more goats than the frost giant and drank enough mead to drown a dozen sailors, and he made love to more than half of the women in the village. Life was good for Thor Odin's son, god of thunder, prince of Asgard. But on that fourth night, there was a scream. Everyone runs outside to see what it is. What was it? The young girl runs up stating that someone is in the water, a devil man, and one of the villagers pulls up a floating head from the water, tossing it to the ground, stating that he is not from their village. Thor looks at the dead man's eye and he says that he was a god. The villagers begin to panic and Thor tells them that whatever it was that killed this man, its skull will be no match for Asgardian steel. He picks up the head and the village elder asks Thor if he's ever seen anything like a butchered god before. Thor examines the head and he says that he's seen gods suffer and bleed. Immortal fathers subject their own sons to torments. But this, I have never seen anything like the horror in this god's eyes. The elder falls to her knees and she begins to chant and Thor asks, To what god are you praying? And she tells him that she is praying to all of them. And the current day on the planet of Indigar, a young alien girl prays for rain on their dry lands, for without it, they shall die. Suddenly there's a strike of thunder as a hammer falls, and with it, rain washes over the ground. Thor grabs Mjolnir and he says that he is Thor, warrior of Asgard, avenger of Earth, and he swears on all that is holy, no one will die today. The young girl runs over telling him that she never thought he would actually come, and Thor tells her that he heard her prayer. What kind of god would he be if he did not answer? As for his aid, the aliens offered Thor their best cave slime ale, and he told them stories of his travels and triumphs. As the young girl sleeps, the elder tells Thor that they owe him their lives, and Thor says that what they owe is this girl and her prayer. Why is it that they do not pray to their own gods? And the elder says that that is because Indigar has no gods. However, as a child, his mother would tell him stories of gods from long ago who lived in a jeweled city high in the clouds. Shocked to hear this, Thor takes the skies to find that jeweled city, and soon he does. He walks through the palace to find no one in sight and nothing disturbed. But there is one thing strange, a storage room with chains locking it tight. With one swing from Mjolnir, Thor breaks the chains, opening the door, and then he smells why no one has been in here. These gods are dead. Hogscar the Harsh, Crawl Skin the Cruel, Lady Vile the Goddess of Atrocities, and the entire pantheon of fearsome immortals, all butchered like animals. While Thor looks around, outside those chains begin to melt and pull together, and Thor realizes what's going on, and he says, Oh hell. He turns back to see a giant black beast lunging at him, and the beast attacks wildly like an animal. No skill, no fury. This is not the killer, this is his guard dog, and a very strong one at that. Thor is knocked into a stone wall, and as he gets back up, he thinks that there is only one person who could have done this. Gore the God Butcher yet lives. And that can only mean one thing, more gods are sure to die. Many millennia from them, in the far-flung future, in the Great Hall of Asgard, King Thor sits upon his throne with no subjects to rule. He shouts for someone to bring him his arm, and then he remembers that he is so damn old, he keeps forgetting that there is no one left but him. He is Thor Odinson, king of a broken Asgard, last of all of the gods, and today, he will try yet again to see Valhalla. With sword and hammer in hand, Thor leaps out into battle against the Black Beast. Knowing whatever may happen, he will face it like a god. Back in the past, young Thor travels with the Vikings across the sea to see more of the gods who were slain and washed up on the shores. They sail for three days until they reach the banks of Neva River, and they find the Slavs. And Thor asks, where are the gods that they pray to? One shouts that their gods will be here soon enough, Norse swine. Piran the Storm Lord and Shirnabog the Black will come on their winged stallions. Soon everyone begins to hear the flapping of wings, and when they look up, they see Piran's steed bloodied and with no Piran. One of the Vikings says that it would appear the gods hadn't the nerve to face him, and Thor takes the steed flying into the skies, telling the Vikings to make sure that they save a cask of ale for him. 
He flies up and he begins to feel the droplets of blood raining down, got blood from the skies. Seconds later, Chernabog the Black rides by, now with his head cut off, dripping blood into the clouds. And behind him is Gore, the God Butcher, readying his black blade. Without even so much as a flash, the winged horse had its own head and legs cut right off, and Thor begins to plummet back to the earth. Gore shouts for him to feel the sense of helplessness. This is how it feels to be mortal. Next, you will learn how it feels to be butchered. As Thor falls, he grabs a hold of Chernabog's steed and he flies back yelling, My name is Thor of Asgard, warrior born, and the last of the gods that you will ever see. Gore asks, Asgardian? I've never killed one of you before, but fret not. Soon the entire pantheon will join you. The two fight in the skies, exchanging blow after blow, and Gore's weapons are unlike anything that Thor has ever seen. They form and they whip about, all striking perfectly, and in one last attempt at victory, Thor slashes into Gore, but he responds by shooting out and knocking Thor off of his horse. Thor tries to fight him off, and Gore takes his black blade, thrusting it into Thor's stomach, and he asks, what are you even the god of? Gore begins to laugh as he brings Thor closer, and Thor tells him quietly, the god of thunder. Suddenly there's a crack whom and the lightning strikes Gore off and the two begin to fall towards Earth. Back in the current time, the present day, the normal middle-aged Thor stands above the defeated beast, thinking that if the strengths of these creatures are a part of Gore that he has grown considerably in the time since they last fought. Molnir then pulls Thor into the air and Thor shouts they must make haste to the omnipotent city, the gods of all-knowing. For the longer that they tarry, the gods will soon suffer. Upon reaching the city, the Lord Librarian takes Thor to the Hall of the Lost, the room filled with books and scrolls on gods who have been inactive. Thor looks at the giant rows of tomes and asks, isn't anyone alarmed by how many of them that there are? And the Librarian tells him that gods come and go, such is the way of things. With so many places to start, Thor picks one, the Oaken King and Sequania of the Garden Eternal. No one has seen them for 2,000 years, and when Thor arrives, he sees exactly why. These gods were nailed to their trees, and just like before, a black beast appears. World after world, planet after planet, all of them the same. The bodies of the gods butchered by a black beast keeping watch. As Thor gazes off the massive body of what was once Falagar the Behemoth, he swiftly kills the black beast. He then rips the head off and he screams to Gore to come and kill him. Come kill Thor if you so dare. Back in the past, young Thor wakes seven days after his encounter with Gore. As he leans up, he asks, did I kill him? And a viking tells him that they are unsure. They just found him lying in the snow. Thor gets up telling the man to bring him meat, mead, and then his axe. Hours later, after regaining some of his strength, Thor sets out into the wilderness to look for Gore, but instead finds another god. The god calls out that he is, or was, Hinkon, Siberian god of the hunt. The black butcher told him to relay a message, and that was to come to his cave along the lake. Just follow the screams. Thor holds out his axe, telling him that there is no honor in the way that the god butcher fights. Now be at peace, Hinkon. The hunt has ended. In the current times, with our present day Thor along the shores of Lake Ladoga, Thor takes Iron Man with him to scan the area for the cave he once found so long ago. Tony tells him that he knows that he can call the Avengers, right? But Thor tells him, no. And Tony says, that's right, god business. That's okay, we got plenty of mortal problems to deal with right now anyway. So Thor looks at the cave that he was once in 1,000 years ago, hoping to never see again. There have been plenty of things that he has forgotten over the years. The face of the first maiden that he kissed, the first troll that he felled, or even the first dragon that he tamed. But this cave, this cave is something that he will remember to the end of time. This is where the God Butcher taught him fear. As he steps in, he calls to Queen Freya that she needs to have every Asgardian called back home. Their gates locked behind them. Anyone of immortal blood is under threat. Freya asks what happened, under threat by whom, and then there's a snap of a twig. Thor grips his hammer and he charges forward at the being fleeing. He grabs a hold of him and the creature shouts, don't hurt him, I am not Gore! And Thor demands to know why he is here. The creature tells him that he is hiding from him. After what happened, Gore would never set foot here. Everything that is happening now is all because of what happened here. It's all because of Thor, that the gods are dying right now. Thor stares at the creature asking, who are you? And he says that his name is Sadruk. He is the type of god that you don't meet every day. One who looked upon the face of Gore and lived. He's not sure why he was kept alive. Why he was made to witness as his whole pantheon was slaughtered by the Black Berserker. Every day he begged to be killed, to stop it all. But Gore just cut off his eyelids and said that he had no choice but to watch. Gore also said that he would never come to this cave. And that he was saving Thor for last. Thor asks where he can find the god Butcher. And Shadruk tells him that there is no need to look. He will appear soon enough. But perhaps... Kronux. Thor then tells Shadrach to come with so together they may finally end this thing once and for all. And later at the omnipotent city, Thor and Shadrach head to the Halls of All-Knowing to find more information on Kronux when Thor finds Librarian beaten. 
Shadrix begins to panic, stating that he knew he shouldn't have come. If only he could close his eyes. And back in the past, the young Thor wakes to find himself bound and chained, hanging in front of Gore. Gore tells him that he is now awake and he will tell him where to find Asgard, so that he can watch how he kills everyone there. Thor shouts that you can wrap me in as many chains as you want, but I will never say. Gore tells him, you know, I'm not exactly a novice in the ways of torture. I once tortured the god of torture. After an evening with him, he gave up where his children were hiding. Thor struggles to free himself and Gore tells him, I have so rarely taken my time anymore. Hopefully, you can prove to be of some excitement. Back in the current times, in the present day, Thor begins to fight back the Berserkers when the Librarian bashes one with the books. Thor shouts that these beasts are up to something, trying to hide something from Kronux. Who is the god called Kronux? And the Librarian tells him that Kronux isn't a god, you imbecile. It's a world, a hidden one at that, and only the book can tell you where to find it. It's over there burning. Thor reaches down and he opens the scroll to read its contents and soon it begins to burn to ash. And Thor tells him, It may have burned, but I read what I needed. I fly to Kronix, the palace of infinity. Meanwhile, on Kronix, the berserkers slaughter all of the gods there, draining their blood into a large pool. Gore looks at the last god and he asks, Is this enough? And the time god tells him, It will have to be. There's none left. Gore tells him, Just keep in mind, if I don't return, the Berserkers will tear you apart. The god says that he can't promise that he wouldn't be killed once he gets to where he's going. You're going extremely far back. Do you even know what's waiting there? And Gore says, I know more about gods and their history than you do, last god of Kronix. As Gore begins to step into the pool, the god says that there will always be peaceful beings, caretakers of time. And Gore tells him, there are two kinds of gods, those who do harm and those who do nothing at all. And I had yet to decide which is more worthy of my wrath. Soon enough, though, you will all be dead. As Gore is sinking into the pool, the worlds begin to change as he teleports back 14 billion years ago into the void. He looks upon the Elder Gods, seeing how he made awkward creations, all minutes old and already begging for death. Life will still find a way to thrive, though. However, they will not be worshipping this god, at least, for he is Gore, son of the Nameless Father, and he still believes the dream of a godless age. Soon the blood begins to bubble, and Gore reaches up, pulling himself out, and the god says, Impossible. Gore tells him, sorry to disappoint, but Gore yet lives and I have claimed my prize, the still warm heart of an elder god. Now all I need is a moon or two, some centuries to myself and some space to build, to slave. I need so many slaves. But before he can leave, lightning strikes Gore and Thor shouts, it is time that you know the wrath of Thor. Back in the past, with the younger Thor, Gore asks Thor, should he stop now? It's been 17 days and you've endured far longer than even the sturdiest of the immortals. Gore stands up telling him, Come on, is there anyone in your family that you hate? A sibling, perhaps a parent, just tell me. However, there comes a shout from outside and the Vikings rush in stating that they shall redden their spears. Rather than a thousand deaths for one retreat, this night they will feast in Valhalla and die for Thor. Gore tells the men that they need to stop this. He has come to liberate them from the yoke of the divine servitude. And the men don't listen and they continue to fight. So Gore says, fine, you shall die for your god. See if he even takes notice. One by one, the men are killed and slaughtered, and Thor uses all of his strength to free himself. As Gore grabs the last of the men, he asks, where are the gods now? Do you see the truth yet? Where is your savior, Thor? However, without a word, Thor grabs his axe and he swings it upward, cutting off Gore's arm. In the current times, the present day, the Berserkers overwhelm Thor, and they hold him down as Gore tells him, I thought you were dead that day, but instead, they saved you. I've saved you from a life of failure, which is why I must repay my debt by letting you die last. Gore looks at the last of the time gods and he asks if it's done. And the god says that he's programmed it just as he asked. One of Gore's tendrils whip out and stab into the god's neck. And then the berserkers hang him over to drain his blood into the pool. Gore shouts that all the gods will die from the first to the last. He must go now and build an army and explore the new horizons of Deicide. As Gore sinks into the pool, he tells Thor to make sure that he stays alive for a very long time. I would be terribly disappointed if we do not meet again. And Thor shouts for him not to go, and he bursts out of the pile of berserkers. He shouts, the universe is not big enough to hide, and he rockets after Gore into the pool. The world shifts and we see the broken ruins of Asgard, and Thor asks, where is the Butcher of the Gods? And a voice tells him, well look at that, I wasn't expecting you. King Thor steps out and Thor asks, what happened to the Asgardian father? 
King Thor tells him, I am not your father, you beardless whelp. Now get ready with that hammer and show me you're all that I remember you to be. Together, the two Thors fight and they destroy the Berserkers. And as they go, King Thor notices that they are dissolving. Bless his eye, they're being pulled back. Thor asks, where is the God Butcher? He was just behind me. And King Thor says, right behind you? You're even dumber than I remember. He goes on explaining that he did appear at the same exact spot that he did, but he's late. The God Butcher has been here for 900 years, and he's been busy. Elsewhere, Gora returns his berserkers into himself, stating that it would seem that we have another Thor. Splendid! We can never have too many of those. I once said that I would save him for last, and that day is imminent. And soon, the first day of a new age of freedom will begin. Three thousand years in the past, on a planet that had no name, the young Gor sat with his mother, as they slowly starved on their barren planet. With the last of their cave apple, they offered it to the gods to watch over them and help them through this hardship. The young Gor asked why would they pray to the gods to watch over them, when they allowed his father to die from the sun fevers. His mother told him that his father lived a long life, and they will soon see him again when the night comes. He will be there with the rest of the blessed ancients that shine upon them. Gor then asks, but why? Why can't he see his father? Why can't he ever see the gods? His mother patted him on the shoulder, telling him, You must always honor the gods, and they will shower you with blessings. But then there was a booming roar from the distance, and Gore's mother grabbed her spear, telling her son to run and never look back, and may the gods watch upon him. As Gore did that, leaving his mother behind, he never did see her again. The days turned the months, and the months turned the years, and Gore found a small bit of happiness with his wife. One day, his wife, who was expecting their second child, fell victim to an earthquake that took her life. All the while, Gore begged and pleaded with the gods to please save him and his family. And as many months went by, Gore and his son traveled in search of something to eat. His son asked if there was really a waterfall over the hills, and Gore told him, yes, there's a waterfall. Trees thick with fruit, so much that we will never be hungry again. Later, Gore buried his son could not even cry, for there was no water left inside of him. He told his son that he was sorry. Sorry for bringing him into this wretched world. And the tribe leader, Rugak, told Gore that he can't do this. Burying his son's body is forbidden. The dead must hang from the trees so that the gods may take him into the sky. By leaving him in the ground, he only damns his soul to sacrilege. But the only words that Gore could find is that they are already damned! The tribe leader asked, what did you say? And Gore lashed out, telling him to open his eyes. We move from one dried up cave to the next, eating slime off the bottom of rocks, leaving only a trail of our dead behind. The tribe leader shouts that he must be careful with his blasphemies, for the gods hear every word. Gore then says, there is only us. The sooner that you accept that, the sooner that we can. But before he can finish, someone from the tribe throws a rock, hitting him in the head. The rest of the tribe joins in, stoning Gore until he falls. And the tribe leader says that he is now an outcast. May the gods have mercy on his soul, though he expects the sun will not. Gore is left to die alone, and he manages to crawl through the deserts, waiting for the moment that he can finally just die. However, before that moment can come, there's a fire in the sky that crashes down onto the planet's surface. He runs over asking, why can't I ever die in peace? And what he finds are two gods struggling for power. The god in gold lifts his bloody hand, asking for help from the dying life form. And Gore asks him, help? Help you? Where were you? Where were you when my children were starving? When my wife was screaming for your help? When my mother was butchered like an animal? Where were you when we needed the gods? From the god in black, a strange black liquid shoots into Gore's hand. And he took that power and he killed the two gods. He had just killed his first gods and there was only one question that he had left. Were there more gods to kill? Many centuries went by, and Gore goes on telling the story of how he came to be to a slave god. He then asks if it answers his question, and the god tells him no. I asked what the weapon that you use is, the one that you stole from a god. And Gore whips the god, telling him, You speak like someone who would rather die than be whipped. What is your name? The god shouts in pain, telling him that he is Volstag. He is, or he was, Volstag the Valiant Lion of Asgard. Gore goes on whipping and Volstagg tells him, Not even the Allfather can save you now. But in the end, there will still be the mighty Thor. Rage takes over and Gore stabs a stake into Volstagg's hand. And after a moment, he tells his son that he can come out now. His son asks, when will it be over? When will all of the bad gods be gone, father? And Gore walks his son out as Volstagg is bound to a cross telling him, Soon, very soon. Back in the past, the young Thor wakes from a nightmare where he sees Gore's face, telling him that he is not finished. Thor wakes up stating, he isn't dead. And the woman with him asks him, who? 
Thor tells her, do not worry your pretty little head. And the woman gets up telling him that he should know that she makes war like she makes love. Naked and in a berserker rage. Thor then says that he's coming at the shadows. It's been eight days since I killed the god butcher and I wished to not dream any more of this night. She drops her blanket and sword stating that she can do for the glory of Asgard. Meanwhile, in the ruined Asgard, Thor asks, what happened here? Is that the arm of the destroyer? King Thor asks if he simply is going to gawk at him like some half-witted Hercules, or may we see to our business? The two walk, and as Thor looks around, he notices the high seat of Odin, though no one but the Allfather is allowed here. King Thor tells him, that's right. Well, I am the Allfather, and you are, what again? An Avenger? Guardian of the galaxy? Have you moved to the sun to become a cosmic cop yet? Thor asks him, what? No. And King Thor says, just forget everything I just said then. King Thor looks through the terminal and says, by my beard. They're gone. Gore had called the Black Berserkers home for the first time in 900 years. We still have a chance. King Thor walks on telling his younger self to make himself ready for war. This is no mere Ragnarok that comes. This is an apocalypse unparalleled. But before leaving, King Thor says that there is a chamber in the East Wing, one that only all fathers are allowed in, and on the eve of their extinction, go there and make ready so that they can leave. Thor walks telling himself, this can't be right. Perhaps this is one of those alternate futures that the X-Men are always on about. And what could you possibly need me to make ready for myself? I am ready to pound the Butcher of Gods into the dirt once and for all. A massive door swings open, revealing the Allfather's room is full of... Ale. And then Thor responds with, well, I suppose that one drink wouldn't hurt. Back in present day, Thor's night of lust is interrupted by two of the Black Berserkers grabbing and pulling him outside. He cleaves one, asking, Where is the one-armed coward? The second Berserker then takes out a magic crystal and throws it at Thor. The ground begins to change and Thor sinks through it into a pink glow surrounding him. As he is lifted up, the future Gore looks down, telling him, Ah, my favorite Thor. Welcome to the place where the gods go to die. Over in the future, Thor and his king version get ready to depart on... Skithblatnir. And the king mentions that for the first time in a long time, he can feel it. The Thor Force. The younger version asks, wait, don't you mean the Odin Force? We wield the awesome power of the Odin Force. And King says, we call it the Thor Force now. And we have been for 10,000 years. I've even held it longer than the old man ever did. But let us leave for honor in the realm eternal, for vengeance divine. The last charge of the armies of Asgard. The last ride of the gods of thunder. Currently, in the present day at Omnipotent City, the great librarian tries to save what documents he can, but the one with the location of Kronux was lost. The librarian turns to Shadrox, asking, Who are you again? What are you a god of? And Shadrox tells him, It's better this way. You wouldn't have helped. This way is better. And the librarian asks, How? How can I help him? If I have to dig through these records to find out who you are, I will beat you senseless with the tome. Shadrach begins to cry, stating, He came to me, asking how to build it. To make him stop killing my people, I agreed. I am Shadrach, the god of bombs. While the current and future Thors ride to Gore's unholy world, the youngest of the Thors is put to work collecting materials for the massive god bomb. But after one last crack of the whip, he throws the stone onto a berserker, shouting for them to come. This god is no man's slave. Someone grabs him by the hair and a voice asks, What the hell does he think he's doing? Thor asks who dares lays a hand on him, but before he can finish, a woman kicks him to the ground stating, She dares! Now get back to work or it'll be both your arms broken so that you can clean the boots with your tongue. Thor whips the blood from his mouth stating that he will never submit to the will of Gore. And to see such cowardice among his fellow gods fills him with the shame for all of divinity. The woman asks, did this boy god really just call us cowards? And the red-headed sister says that she wouldn't mind if he reached through his stubborn, beardless face to rip out his stone. Maybe he'll be less annoying. The orange-haired sister says, But he's so handsome. Seems like a shame to waste it, not to mention the stones. The blonde one tells Thor, You best be back in line. And she won't tell him again. He's going to get some poor god killed with his immature pride. As the girls walk off, Thor has no idea that these girls are Atli, Ilisfa, and Frigg. Goddess is a thunder, and his own future grandchildren. As Thor has worked as a slave, moving rocks and materials from one place to the next, as he sets a stone down, he quietly asks, What the hell is that thing anyway? Gore's son happily tells him it's a bomb, and it's going to kill all the gods. After 900 years of labor, it's almost finished. Thor asks, Do you think it's really a good thing killing all of the gods? And the son says that it will be a better world without them. No more fear of eternal damnation or lust for eternal reward. No more hatred between believers of rival faiths. Thor leans down, stating, You should flee this world. Your father's going to die for what he has done by his own hands. Fates be willing. 
The sun then holds out a finger and using the darkness to pierce into Thor's throat, he tells him, never speak ill of my father again. You are but a jealous god. Now get back to work before I have you crucified. As the night comes, the god slaves gather to discuss their plans. Plans that must be acted upon now before it is too late. Some of the gods say that they should do it tonight, and Frigg says that it's not a matter of when, but rather who. Who among them can they trust to lead the way and carry the burden, knowing that even if they succeed, they will still die? A voice tells her that if she is talking about destroying that bomb and killing that bastard Gore, then look no further for he is their god. Thor jumps down and Frigg tells him, No offense, friend, but we don't even know who you are. Thor announces, I am the favorite son of Odin, the Omnipotent, heir to the throne of the Eternal Asgard, the Lord of Storm and God of Thunder. You may call me Thor. Elisvith gasps, oh my heavens, I've been having impure thoughts about my grandfather. Frigg says, Gore is known to pull gods out of the time stream, so if you really are who you say you are, then you should have no trouble summoning a thunderstorm to cover our attack. Thor looks away, stating that he has tried. This world is too barren. There are no storms that answer Thor's call. Frigg tells him, fear not, even the rain god could not make do anymore. But our plan is simple, destroy the bomb before it is finished. Thor asks, how? It is the size of the moon. Do you really expect me to destroy it with a few ragged slaves with clubs and sharp stones? As two gods set a glowing stone down, Frigg tells him that for the last 900 years, we ragged slaves have mined the cores of dead stars and broken planets for Gore's god bomb. This scrap of unstable matter is all that we need to steal and hide. We have a bomb of our own. Frigg looks away, stating, The only issue is getting close enough to set it off. There are different ways, but each would lead to death. She then asks everyone by a show of hands who is willing to volunteer to, and Frigg stops, looking at the place where the bomb used to be. And she says, Oh, you stupid, stupid Thor. Outside, Thor runs through with the makeshift bomb, asking for one last storm. That's all I ask! If today the god of thunder must die screaming, then let the sky scream with him. Just then, the low rumbles of thunder can be heard, and it begins to fire off from the clouds. The sisters watch, and Frigg says, She'll be damned. He is Thor, and Eli's Fiv shouts, Go, Granddad, go! With all of his strength, Thor throws the bomb into the side of the giant god bomb, and the explosion goes off! Up in the skies, the Thors feel the tremors from the explosion, and the king tells the younger, You'd best get your hammer. Something is close. On the side of the longboat, a hand reaches up, gripping its side, and then the beast climbs aboard, screaming, hitting Thor with a space shark. The king blasts through it, and Thor asks, What just happened? Was I really struck in the face by a shark? What manner of foul beast has Gore conjured up this time? King stares at the beast, stating, The foulest, I'm afraid. Seems we found another one. The youngest then asks, Are you really my father? And King says, By boar's bones. Are we certain there isn't any ale left? With a brief exchange of words, we now have the older King Thor, the middle-aged present-day Thor, and the youngest Thor, readying themselves for battle. King, Thor, and youngest. And the youngest explains that the bomb that they attempted to use on the god bomb left it untouched, not even a scratch. King Thor tells him, I hope that you are a better slayer of god butchers than dismantler of bombs. And the youngest shouts, calling out to Gore. But Thor tells him, nay. The time for words is past. Now let the hammers talk! As the ship begins to descend downward, the Thors see a black creature appear before them, and Gore tells them that they really should have brought more Thors. The youngest jumps off shouting, and the king follows, stating, These idiot children have yet to learn what it means to be the king. For the glory of Asgard! The Thors fight valiantly, and Gore's weapons make their efforts for naught. King gathers his strength, stating, I've waited 900 years to feel the thunder in my blood again. Let's see if it's still there. He holds out his arm, releasing the Thor Force, blasting Gore light years away into a far off planet. With the awesome might of the All Father unleashed, the God Butcher had felt something that he hasn't felt in a millennia fear. Gore begins to hurl chunks of the planet back towards the Thors, shouting, I need more blood! Massacre all of the gods! Down on the unholy planet, the Black Berserkers slay groups of gods, all throwing them into a pile, allowing the darkness to take them. With that darkness, it reaches up into space to aid Gore with the power in the form of a giant serpent. As the serpent begins to swallow two of the Thors, Gore says that he can feel them drowning. No Thor shall survive this day! The youngest's voice calls out, and no gore will either. Faster, you stupid shark! And with one mighty swing of the two-handed hammer, Thor launches gore back into the planet, telling him, I know that you pray to no god, but if you'd like, you can pray to me now. Back with the serpent, King musters his strength to open up the beast's jaws, telling the younger to hurry and go. Let the Lord of Asgard deal with the worm. 
The mighty Thor races down to the planet, swinging into Gore so hard that he could feel his fingers crack and his muscles tear. And yet he swung again, even harder than before, and again, and again! With each and every cut, Thor could feel Gore's weapon creep inside of him, burrowing deeper into his flesh. Thor ignored the pain, focusing on the bludgeoning, ignoring everything else. And as the struggle continued, it took the cracking of a planet to snap his mind back to reality. The planet surfaced because the crack had explode, and there to mend it is Thor. And soon the fissures are settled. As Thor returns to the battle, Gore tells him, I understand you now. The old you is fueled by regret. The young one uses his arrogance and rage to mask his crippling shame. And as for you, you try so desperately to seem noble, all because you see just how petty and useless your kind really are. At that moment, the king, the youngest, and the Thor came together to fight side by side to take down the universe's greatest foe. King blasts Gore one more time towards the sun, and the mighty Thor shouts to follow. The group flies faster and faster towards the sun until there is no sight of anyone. And just then, for the first time in the galaxy, people could look up and see the sun turn black. Down on the unholy planet, it began to rain, and it rained blood. God blood. Next, it rained hammers, and then Thor's, and despair. Gore stands atop the three bodies, shouting, Make ready the bomb. The thunder fell silent, and as King Thor was nailed to a comet and sent roaring through the space, Thor the Avenger was cast into the ground that opened into a great black maw. Molnir's lay encased in a cage of god flesh, unable to fly to the master's hands. And the youngest found himself too spent to even muster a curse as the countdown began. Gore drags the youngest through the lands when his wife runs up asking if he is unharmed. Please tell her that her love is unharmed. And Gore tells her, go back inside, it'll all be over soon. His wife praises him, stating how she waited for this day for so many years. He has suffered so much, endured horrors beyond imagining, and he is the only being that she has ever known worthy of worship. He is the brightest star in all of the heavens. He is Gore, her lover, her savior, and her god. Gore releases his grip on the youngest, and then he turns back asking, what did you just say? She explains that what she said was that he is. But before she could finish, Gore uses a tendril and stabs inside of her mouth, telling her, I am no one's god. Moments later, Gore's son runs up asking if it's true. Is it time to trigger the bomb? Gore tells him, indeed it is. And if you could, go to the tower and look for your mother. I have many gods to kill. The boy smiles, yes. And of course, make sure to kill them all. But before leaving, he turns to see his mother's hand sticking out of the sand. As Gore walks to the entrance of the bomb, he says, It took us 900 years to make this, and now it will explode throughout time, killing every god who has ever lived and ever will. He then takes Thor's hand, and he slams it into the door, stating, Amen. And a path opens. Gore drags the youngest, stating, Only a few more drops in the pool of forevers. Now bleed, god of thunder. Bleed for my blessed bomb. Down on the crack of the planet, the mighty Thor struggles to maintain his hold. And then he hears a voice talking to him. Gore's son tells him, you will never make it. Gore's triggering the bomb as we speak. And Thor tells him, you must run away. This is no place for the likes of you. The boy says that he cannot. He is what his father created. But the question now is, what is his father? He was a good man once, a family man, a loving man who suffered unfairly. But what would his younger self say of his older self now? Thor tells him, you must leave now. Take whatever family you the boy says, my mother is dead. She always dreamed of a life after the bomb, but there is never going to be a life after it. Gore is dead, and in his place is something that I have been raised to despise. Thor loses his grip, and he falls back, and the boy catches him, stating, I know not how to pray, but I will pray for you, God of Thunder. Pray that you will kill my father. At that moment, there's a rumble in the ground, and the cage of god flesh pops, freeing the hammers. Back inside of the god bomb, the youngest screams in pain, asking Gore, If you want my heart so badly, I will gladly trade you for an eye. The youngest leaps up, sinking his teeth into Gore's eye socket, and then he's thrown out of the bomb. Gore steps out, shouting, You are too late. You are all too damned late. Thor spits into the eye, stating, that's one down. Now just to take the other. And then a battle cry from Attili can be heard. And Thor asks if she's holding Jornbjorn. He takes the axe from her and Attili shouts to get his own. But he says he's sorry. This axe and him have unfinished business. With two hammers returning to the rightful owners, the two missing Thors come crashing down to the planet. With everyone distracted, a berserker kills the last god needed. And he pulls his heart out to finally begin the era of man. The youngest Thor fights outside while the older two fly into the god bomb's core to try to stop it. But once they get in, Gore tells them, You are but too late! Behold your doom! 
The king rockets down to Pingor, and Thor asks, what do we do? The bomb's triggered. King shouts, you're a Thor. You hit it with a hammer. And with the power of two hammers, Thor does just that. However, as he swings at the core, he thinks, just for a bit, what if Gore was right? What if a godless age is what man deserves? What if Gore isn't a madman at all? God helped him. What if he is? The bomb goes off and its effects can be felt across all of time, killing each and every god in existence. And as the mighty Thor grips the two hammers, the darkness begins to go into him. Gore asks, what are you doing? And the king tells him that he is dying, like a god. All across time, the dying gods can see one thing, a vision, a vision of a god with a mighty hammer in each hand, fighting at the heart of a bomb to save them. It was at that moment that every god in all of the universe closed his eyes, and he prayed for Thor. The king holds Gore back as Gore shouts, he's absorbing it. He's taking the blast into himself, that is not possible. And the king laughs, ha 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 ha. Then we shall watch the impossible together. In only a few moments, the blast soon begins to fade and all that's left is Thor, covered in darkness, holding two hammers. Thor tells Gore that this is no longer his weapon. It laughs at him. The name of it is the All Black, the Necrosword, the Slicer of Worlds, the Annihila Blade. And it is meant to be wielded by a god. But you are right about one thing. It was meant to kill them. He takes the power of his two hammers and he releases their full devastating force into Gore. And as the smoke clears, Gore is left with nothing, nothing but his son. He calls out to him and his son tells him that he can't blame the gods anymore. It wasn't a god who betrayed him, it was only ever yourself. The son begins to drip into a black puddle and Gore tells him, please, don't leave me alone. The mighty Thor asks, how? The boy, he helped me defeat you, Gore. And the king tells him no, it was a lonely little man who helped him defeat the god butcher. Gore screams out and the youngest swings his axe, cutting off his head, stating, enough of that. Shall we drink mead and think of ways to defile his ashes? However, that day was the day that Thor died. For the ninth time, that could be remembered. And three days later, he rose again. He woke up screaming, saying that it was so strange, there were three of him, and the king tells him, it appears dying hasn't made you any smarter, has it? Thor asks, what of the Necrosword? The king says, we left it, dared not to touch it again. The youngest says, I would have, if his majesty here hadn't thrown the whole damn planet into a black hole and then brought you back from the dead. King says, that's right, burned out the last of Gore's sickness. But I figured that it was in my best interest. So would you like to see what you died for? The Thors walk outside and King Thor says, Asgard lives again. And with the gods from all of the cosmos, so with the universe saved, the old king uses his all-father's magic to send his younger selves back into their time stream. Soon, things return to normal. The youngest set out to become the Viking god once again, and the mighty Thor went back to being an Avenger, and the old king sought to make memories with his granddaughters. However, due to the nature of time travel, they knew that their memories of their adventures would fade, and no one would remember this time. Back on the planet of Indigar, Thor returned to see the young girl who prayed but never received an answer. He told her that she prayed to him because she had no gods, and he can assure her now that she never needs to pray to him again. And the world without gods became one with many gods, all thanks to a little girl's prayer and a madman's murder spree. Now, out in the deep reaches of space, Thor looks upon those that were easy enough to find. The dead worlds. Worlds that were once teeming with life but are now either burned or frozen, flooded or dry as a grave. Battles between the armies is something that Thor understands, but who do you fight when it's the world itself killing its people? The Earth is dying, and the God of Thunder knows not who to smite in order to save it. Over in the Southern Ocean, Agent Rosalind Solomon investigates a recent disturbance with a herd of blue whales who seem to be running away from something. As she dives into the water, she finds the cause, the Yashida Industries underwater whaling fleet. Rosalind radios over one of the subs telling them that their presence in these waters are a violation of international law, so surface and prepare to be boarded. The sub doesn't respond by radio and instead fires two torpedoes at Rosalind's car. Next, a harpoon is shot into the car's windshield, and Rosalind quickly ejects before she can be trapped inside. Agent Coulson radios in telling her that backup will arrive in three minutes, but now get to personnel. She may want to call her boyfriend. Rosalind asks, boyfriend? Thor? He just came with me to the Shield Cadets Ball. We're not dating. 
and at that moment, Molnir shoots down into the water, destroying the two whaling subs. Rosalind says that she only sees a hammer, where's the rest of him? And Coulson tells her, 30 miles up in closing. Suddenly, there's a giant splash, and Thor grabs the hammer, bashing it into another sub, shouting, Have at thee, foul Leviathan! Coulson then radios back, stating that once they're finished down there, there's something that he'd like her to take a look at when she's topside. Later in the Glacier Bay National Park of Alaska, CEO Roxanne Dario Anker holds a conference telling the new individuals that they are here today to show them something that can make the world a better place. Global warming has become an issue, and the glaciers are all over the planet and melting away at an alarming rate. As Dario goes on, a helicopter flies over, lowering a large chunk of ice, and once it's set on the stand, Dario tells them that this is what they've been gathered here today to see. This big, blue, beautiful chunk of ice is the end of their problems. It was chiseled out of one of Jupiter's moons, and there is plenty more where that came from. As Dario goes to make a toast, Rosalind walks up telling him congratulations. He managed to make even a simple glass of water, ostentatious. Dario tells the crowd to pardon him for a few moments, but please enjoy the water. He turns to Rosalind and he tells her that he's going to assume that she's Agent Rosalind Solomon from S.H.I.E.L.D., correct? Rosalind explains that they know about his ozone depletion project and the greenhouse gas satellites and the mobile factories that even Latvarian government is calling toxic. Now he's trying to profit off the effects of global warming by having a fancy space ice. Dario laughs, stating that all they're trying to do is give the people of today what they need to survive tomorrow. Roxxon is the world's wealthiest and most powerful super corporation. If they don't know what's best for the people of this planet, dare he ask, who does? Just then, the people begin to hear a low, rumbling thunder, and Thor appears with a giant ice boulder, stating, I heard the people of Midgard needed frozen water. Will this suffice? The reporters in the crowd run over, and they surround Thor, asking where he got the ice from, and he tells them just to consider it a generous donation from his old friends, who happen to be frost giants. Then Thor turns to Rosalind, asking, I brought you the largest mountain in all of Jotunheim. Might that finally be enough to win your company for the evening? Rosalind tells him that now is probably not the time, and Dario steps down, stating, What an unexpected pleasure! My name is Dario Agger, CEO of Roxxon Energy. It's so rare that someone in my line of work would get to shake hands with a relative equal. Thor turns to Rosalind and asks, Is this the villain that you spoke of? The one who seeks to poison Midgard for financial gain? Rosalind tells him, yeah, one of the biggest. Think of him as Dr. Doom of corporate scumbags. His nickname back in business school was The Minotaur. Dario says, let it be known. My company has never been convicted of any wrongdoing by any court in the world. Thor looks at Dario and says, You, man of Roxxon, mark well my words. Anyone who threatens Midgard will come to know my hammer in ways that they will find most uncomfortable. A few moments later, back at Dario's floating factory, his advisor says that it costs them $478 billion. The ice pipeline project will have to be put on hold. And as a few of the other advisors begin to project the losses, Dario shouts at them to get out. If they value their lives, get out! As he says this, his eyes begin to turn red and something in him begins to change and back on the ground. Rosal says that there is one thing that Dario is right about, and that's that they can't touch him. His record is squeaky clean. If Roxxon gets caught breaking the law, they'll just pay to change the law. Thor tells her, there's one thing that you have, that's me. And gods are not bound by laws of man. I have a few ideas, perhaps you would like to come to Asgard and discuss it over meat. Rosalind says that she has some forms and stuff to do. So how about they just get coffee tomorrow? Thor shouts, splendid! On the morrow it is, we shall drink coffee and decide what is best to save the world. But many millennia from now, King Thor sits on the once blue planet, thinking how it used to have such pretty shade. King Thor's granddaughter, Atli, says that it is certainly not very blue anymore, more like crap, actually. And Elisfa says that Atli can be quiet, and says that she is sure that Midgard was quite lovely in its day. Frigg then tells him that Elisva is right. It's been gone for a very long time. Perhaps coming back here wasn't such a good idea. But King Thor stands up stating that he didn't come back here to feel sorry for himself. Some things are still worth fighting for. Frigg says that with all due respect, the earth is gone. Its age has passed. Its fate was in a large part its own doing. Then there's a rumble, and as King Thor looks up, he says, It would seem that I'm not the only old fool looking down at this planet. Galactus appears before the Thor of them and tells them one thing. I... HUNGER! Everyone looks up and Frigg says that Galactus has killed more worlds than anything in the history of the cosmos. She does hope that her grandfather knows what this means, and Atli says, yeah, he should have brought his arm. So Thor says, that blasted thing weighs a ton, hurts my back. Frigg shouts, no. It means that it's time to let go of Midgard. There's nothing left of this world that you once loved. You cannot risk battling against a being as powerful as Galactus. King Thor whispers to his hammer, telling it, take my granddaughters back to Asgard and fetch me my arm. 
Frigg says, please don't do this. And King Thor tells her, it is already done. The thunder has spoken. King Thor thrills Mjolnir with all of his strength, creating a portal and sucking the girls up. And Frigg yells, you can't possibly hope to. The King Thor asks, whoever said that I was going to fight him? You can't fight Galactus with one arm and a hammer, but you can die. And I, that I could still do. King Thor makes his way down, calling out to Galactus that the King of Asgard would like to have words with thee. Back in the current times, Thor and Rosalind finish up their meeting at dinner, and Thor asks, so companies like Roxxon are harming the Earth as we speak? And Rosalind tells him that she's working on it, but this is the first time the S.H.I.E.L.D. has ever had an environmental task force. And against Roxxon, they're outmatched. Thor smiles, and Rosalind says that that's the smile of someone who's about to get her in trouble. And he asks, how would you like to see how it feels to stand inside of a thundercloud? Later in the skies above South Africa, Thor asks if she's absolutely certain that there's no one inside. Rosalind tells him that she scanned in, scanned it again. The whole place is automated. It's too toxic for anyone to set foot in. So he holds the hammer in the air and the lightning strikes down on the Roxxon facility. A short while later over on the Roxxon Island, Dario asks, what do they mean by no longer there? His advisors explain that there was some sort of anomaly, a localized superstorm, and what's more, the insurance is refusing to pay. They're stating that it was an act of God. Dario then leads his men into the lab, telling them that this means war. Our enemy has drawn the first blood, and it's time for us to discuss retaliation strategies. There are many projects here, like these bears, for example. Their jaws and stomachs have been augmented, genetically engineered to gorge themselves to the point of obesity. They won't stop eating until they are fat and dead. The plan is to drop them into the rivers in Canada to begin cold-hailing the salmon population. Soon, if anyone is to want salmon, they're going to have to buy it from the Roxxon Hatchery. Also, there's this button. The hatch opens and fish pour onto the men, spelling certain doom for them. And Dario then opens up the cages for the bears, the ones that will eat those fish until they are engorged. And he shouts, all right, let's get brainstorming. Back in the future, King Thor climbs up a rock stating, damn my beard, I should have flown up here before sending that blasted hammer away. Once he gets up though, he shouts to Galactus telling him, I know that you can hear me, stop being rude. Galactus tells him, you have climbed all this way for nothing. That is, unless you have come to watch your Earth die. King Thor tells him, I did not come here to fight. As you can see, I am unarmed. I have come to talk. Galactus turns his attention towards King Thor and he asks, Why do you wish to defend this planet? And King Thor says, It's because it has saved me more times than I can count. And I haven't saved it nearly enough. Galactus goes back to his drill, stating, This planet has defined me more times than I can count. This wretched Earth, it imagined itself so precious, so supremely important. Look at it now. Look what man hath made of the meagerness he was given. All worlds must die. This they all know. And thus, Earth's time is up. Galactus continues digging into the Earth and King Thor shouts, This is my last warning. Step away and we will find another world for you to dine on. I wish to do you no harm. Galactus tells him, Your mind has gone soft. I am done showing you courtesy. You should have left me to eat in peace. Just then, Galactus holds out his hand and a devastating blast shoots from his palm, knocking King Thor to the ground. King Thor pulls himself back up, stating, And you should have killed me when you had the chance. Up in the sky, the arm of the Destroyer and Molnir return to King Thor, and once they are set, King Thor shouts, For Midgard! But back in the current times, Dario punches out the last bear, after eating the other advisors, telling the remaining advisors that, I like that idea. The advisor says that this place is called Broxton, and the next morning, Roxxon trucks begin to make their way into the city. But once again in the future, during the final hours of the planet Earth, King Thor and Galactus battle. As Galactus has King Thor in his grasp, the king swings Mjolnir, breaking one of Galactus' massive hands. King Thor laughs, stating, Ha! Even the bones of giants can be broken. And I would know, I've felled an entire race of them. Galactus then takes his other fist, slamming it down on King Thor with a force that literally punches him through the planet and into the moon. The moon cracks and it explodes, and King Thor says, The bastard just punched me through the earth and broke the moon. I quite liked the moon. Back in the present day, over in Oklahoma, three weeks have passed since Thor returned to Midgard. He missed Broxton, and as he arrived, he begins to cough. When he looks around, he sees something that he wished he didn't see. Roxxon has taken over the once quiet city. Thor flies down to see the old buildings are gone, replaced with new Roxxon owned businesses. And as he takes it all in, Rosalind shouts to him, stating that she's been trying to reach him for weeks. He really needs to get a cell phone. But before he goes and does something, just stop and listen for a second. Still not believing what he is seeing, Rosalind tells Thor that it started a few weeks ago when Roxxon got approval from the state senate to move their flying factories in. Thor begins to say, this is because of me. And Rosalind says, look, I need to be the one to handle this. I'm going to shut these factories down. We just have to do it the legal way. Some of the townspeople begin to walk up to Thor through the smog, all stating their problems. Homes being taken away, nursing homes closed, their water is now polluted. And they ask Thor, why is this happening? 
Thor grits his teeth and he rockets into the air. Up on rocks and island, the sounds of thunder can be heard. And the advisor asks if this was really a good idea. They have over a trillion dollars of equipment here. Dario tells him that he carries a hammer. I have a good idea of how he's going to react. And just as Dario thought, Thor comes crashing and destroying everything directly in front of him. As the armies begin to fire on him, he easily takes out the weapons and Rosalind flies up shouting for him to stop. Thor doesn't respond and Rosalind pulls out her gun telling him that if he does not put the tank down, he'll be fighting her. Thor tosses the tank and tells Dario, Be a fool or a madman. You will end your assault on Broxton at once. Dario asks, What do you mean assault? I simply made a significant financial investment into Broxton. In fact, in a matter of weeks, I've reinvigorated what was once a small town on the brink of collapse. This is all done as a gesture of goodwill towards you after the awkwardness of our previous encounter. Thor tells him, If it's money you want, I'll buy Broxton from you. There is enough gold in the vaults of Asgard to satisfy even your greed. Dario whispers, I don't want your money. At least not until you're on your knees begging me to take it. Thor holds out his hammer, telling him, I will pay. Whether it be in gold of Uru, the choice is yours. Dario then looks back at the men behind him, stating, We're done here, wouldn't you say? One man steps forward, telling him, Yes, we've seen quite enough. And the man walks to Thor, telling him, Thor Odinson of Asgard, you've been served. Thor looks at the paper, asking, What is this? And Rosalind sighs, stating, Oh, hell, that means they're suing you. The lawyer goes on stating that, You've never been sued before, so I'm going to explain. Roxanne is not only seeking compensation for the damages that occurred here today, but also the recent destruction of the various facilities. Also, a restraining order has been filed that will prohibit you from coming within 300 yards of any Roxanne facility on the face of Earth, and that includes the town of Roxanne. Thor's jaw drops. This cannot be! And Dario tells him, you could go back to fighting goblins and rescuing unicorns, or whatever it is you do. But back in the future, the battle between King Thor rages throughout the galaxies. The more that they rage, the more the ground beneath their feet turns to dust. No matter who claims victory in the King Thor versus the Galactus battle, it would appear that the Earth is doomed. As Galactus's giant body falls to the ground, King Thor hurries over telling him, Yield! Yieldor! But King Thor's words trail off as he begins to see the skeletal remains of those that once lived on this lovely planet. Galactus tells him, you have failed the Earth before, as you can see. Failed to save those wretched humans from themselves. So tell me, tell me how it feels to see this. Tell me if it stings. Galactus then holds out his hand, releasing a blast so powerful that it could kill even the All-Father. And back in the present, Thor stands in the outskirts of Broxen, where the sign that once said, Neighbor to the Gods, now reads, Where Gods feared a tread. As Thor tries to figure out a plan, Dario is continuing his own plans that involve Ulik, the King of the Trolls. Though in the future, the destroyed planet would seem to have finally succumbed to Galactus's hunger. The skies crack with lightning and Galactus asks if he's back for more already. Now that I have peace to you, you will find that there is not a man alive who may stand before my might. The three granddaughters fly down and Ellie Siv says that it's a good thing that they aren't men. And Frigg shouts, Girls of Thunder, take him down! The three waste no time in beating into Galactus, asking where is it that he sent their grandfather. He must also speak quickly before his tongue becomes a bed for their goats. Galactus asks, Is that all that you seek? Well, very well, little one. I will see to it that you will join Thor, wherever it is that he is dying. Back in the past, a few more days go by and Rosalind is no closer to finding a solution to stopping Roxxon than she was in the beginning. However, tonight she is investigating recent sinkhole appearances that appear to be mysteriously popping up all over Broxton. She flies down into one and a boulder breaks and it crashes down onto the flying car. Rosalind crawls out stating, there goes another car, Coulson's going to kill me. And a voice tells her, not likely, not unless he hurries. Rosalind looks up and says, you are, you actually, what the hell are you? Ulick tells her, we are trolls. What are you? Rosalind pulls out her gun, telling them that she is Agent Rosalind from S.H.I.E.L.D., and they're all under arrest. And Ulick laughs, stating, Yes, I'm sure we are. Now eat her quickly. Just save me a thigh. With that, Rosalind loads a magazine into her gun and begins to let off into the trolls. Back in the future, the Goddesses of Thunder also continue their fight. Elisiv is wielding the weapons of her great uncles, Fandel and Hogan. Frigg, feeling the power coursing through her body, swings the hammer Stormbreaker, and Atli uses the great axe Jarnbjorn. They are a match made in Valhalla, or hell. If there is one thing to note, though, it is that Galactus is not the least bit amused by their actions. He shouts at them, You are nothing but insects before the might of the world eater. Fly back to Asgard, little gob bugs. Frigg pulls back her arm, telling Galactus, be careful, for even the tiniest bug can cause a giant to choke. The hammer is thrown down Galactus's throat, and Frigg holds out her arm, and the hammer returns, ripping and blowing off Galactus's jaw. Atlee shouts that that is enough, let them kill this bastard already, and Galactus calls to them, 
many have tried, including your fool of a grandfather. Your withered bones will litter these cosmos from one end to the other. All while Galactus still burns like a billion suns. But as Galactus begins to release his power many light years away, the Allfather begins to wake up asking, Where am I? Once Molnir appears before him, King Thor remembers what he is doing. He's saving Earth from Galactus. However, as he takes the strap of the hammer, King Thor flies in the opposite direction of where Earth is. In the present, Dario walks through Broxton, enjoying the recent progress that his company has made when he hears the roars of thunder. Dario walks over to Thor, stating, You're making this almost too easy. You should have at least brought Daredevil with you as legal counsel. Thor tells him, You may have lawyers, but I have a hammer. However, if it will end these people's suffering, then I, Thor, will beg this day. How much begging will it take for you to feel like a man? Dario takes out a device and presses a button telling him, I wouldn't know. It's been a very long time since I felt like anything quite so simple as a man. Just then the floor begins to shake and the ground begins to fall into the sinkhole. Hands reach out and they begin to grab onto Thor and he shouts asking, what devilry is this? Dario begins to walk up in his minotaur form telling him, ah, oh, never mind. But please continue. I believe the begging was just about to start. Back in the future, King Thor finds what he was looking for. A black hole. At least, back then it was a mere black hole. Now it is something more. Dark. King Thor takes his hammer and after spinning it, he goes through the darkness and begins to carve a path into it. He flies into the small opening to claim what was once thrown away, never to be touched again. All black, the Necro Sword. The blade that slew a billion gods. The black blade of Gore the Butcher. And the last hope for planet Earth. Back on Earth, the three sisters stand after another attack by Galactus, and Frigg shouts that they're about to die here on this chunk of rock once known as Midgard, and they will die for the All-Father. Atli Siv says, I, for their grandfather Thor, and Atli yells, to hell with it, for blood and guts and glory, and also for Thor. Galactus stomps on the ground, asking, Did I just hear that you're ready to die? But before Galactus can land the finishing blow, lightning begins to strike, and Galactus asks, How many times do I have to kill these Asgardians? Atli Siv says, He's back! Isn't he? And Frigg quietly asks, what has their grandfather done? The girls look up into the sky to see the All Black, the All Father, the God of Butchers, the Necrothor, the Eater of World Eaters. As he comes racing down, he blasts straight into Galactus's torso. Meanwhile, back in the present day, one of the trolls holds Thor still as Ulick punches into his stomach. Thor manages to curse him, telling him, You will rot in Nastron for this, if I allow you to survive the day. Ulick tells him, A troll's home is wherever we can carve it, such as it always has been. And then he punches again. Dario calls out to Ulick, That's enough. It's time to get down to business. Once he readies himself, he charges into Thor, knocking him into cars and anything else in his path. And from the smoke and debris, Dario walks out, dragging Thor, telling the trolls, Earn your pay! Pillage and destroy! Murder at will! Burn everything to the ground! Ulick shouts to the others in other words, Brothers, go be trolls! Thor struggles to pull himself up, telling Dario, You're just another monster. Hired trolls to kill men transformed into a beast with the strength of the Hulk? So that means... Dario leans down asking, Yes? What does that mean, oh mighty god of thunder? And seconds later, the sound of a thunderous punch can be heard from all across as a body is shot into the air and onto rocks on island. Through the smoking body, Dario crashes back to the ground and Thor tells him, That means that I can finally do that. Now the final battle for the two Thors can finally begin as they both begin fighting for their very lives in order to protect the Earth. One in the present day, one in the future. The mighty Thor battling against all the odds to hold the trolls with Dario back. And the King Thor using the dark power that is the Necroblade to unleash a power never once seen. But as true as there is a King Thor in the future, the mighty Thor does prevail. And Dario is stopped for now. As Thor looks up to see his work, he weeps. Knowing where his tears fall, nothing will ever grow again until the end of time. The king, too, sits back to examine his work, finding it surprising that Thor, the king of Asgard, still draws breath and bleeds. But where those drops of god blood fell, the dead rock drinks it deep, and the earth has blood of its own again. The last day of Midgard. It would seem we'll have to wait until another tomorrow. In the wake of the destruction that once was the city of Broxen, a man tells the people how the sickness came and his name was Asgard. Dario tells the news reporters that if they look around, they can see what happens if they allow the gods to walk the earth. It was their fault that the trolls came and it's their fault that these attacks happened in the first place. But perhaps it may be partly their faults as well. Trolls and ogres are a normal part of their lives, but it shouldn't be of theirs. So it is time for everyone to gather together to tell these Asgardians to go back to wherever it is that they came from. Days pass since Dario's speech and She-Hulk Jennifer Walters walks out of the courtroom telling Rosalind that the injunctions for Thor have been lifted, but that's not their biggest problem. What Dario has been feeding the people is working. Congress wants to revoke Asgard's embassy status. Rosalind tells her, thanks for letting her know, she's gonna try and speak to Thor now. As she tries to get out of her third car, she asks if it's alright if she parks here. 
Heimdall tells her that her flying chariot will be safe in Asgard. She has his solemn vow. Roslyn says, okay, cool. Not sure if I should be dipping or something. And then she looks for Thor. Heimdall says that she must follow her ears. The rumbling will direct her where to go. Inside of the halls, more thunder can be heard and the All-Mother begins to ask if the indoor thunder is really necessary. Thor sits up asking if they voted already, if there's still a chance for the fools to listen to reason. And she tells him that there's a growing unrest in the Nine Realms, as he can already see. Meliketh and his Dark Elves continue to scheme from their swamps. Every day there are more worrisome rumblings coming from the land of the Frost Giants, and even some claim to see war bonfires burning once again. Whatever is coming for them, they must face it out there, out where they belong. It is decided. Asgard is leading, and as for the All-Mother, she is commanding him to do his princely duty, or she'll find someone else to carry that hammer. And as his mother, she understands his pain. If there is one thing that she can part on him, it is that sometimes they must let go of the things that they love most. Later, as Rosalind finds Thor, he looks out into the world, stating that Roxxon is one. Dario is a murderous monster who consorts with trolls, and yet he walks free. The Congress of Worlds bent to his will, and it has been decided that Asgard must go. Rosalind says, wait, you're leaving Earth? What about Broxton? And Thor tells her that the first time he came to lay eyes upon Midgard, people there still lived in caves and fought one another with sticks and stone. In those days, he only came to make war and revelry, to be worshipped and feared, and above all else, to destroy. His world and his people have changed so much since then, but has he? Down below, the people of Broxton try to clean up their broken town, and a little girl picks up her half-destroyed teddy bear. A glorious light then shines down. Thor, along with some of Asgard's finest, kneel before the people, telling them that they all know that it is a time of hardship. But they humbly ask the favor, may they please be of assistance. As Thor and the others clean, Jane tells them they are here to bury buildings, not people today, remember that. Thor says that these are more than just buildings. When he brought Asgard to this land, there was life, and now Asgard leaves and there is nothing. He did this, and he is not worthy of this world. Jane asks, you're not planning on leaving, right? And he tells her, no, no, I would never do that. I was hoping that you could. It is more important than ever that someone speak for Midgard in the Congress of Worlds, and I know a not a finer candidate. She says it is quite an honor, but she's really not sure that she's qualified to. There's still the cancer treatments. Thor tells her that they have a rainbow bridge that can take her anywhere in the cosmos. And after some thought, she decides that maybe, maybe she should go. Meanwhile, across the way, Dario gets ready to leave. Before he gets into his car, Rosalind calls out to him, punching him in the face. The people hold her back, and she shouts that she just wanted him to know that this wasn't over. She will prove what he did here and nail his bullheaded butt to the wall for it. Dario's eyes glow red and he tells her that she has his word, that he will sue her into oblivion for this assault. She storms off telling him it's a great idea. Too bad he's murdered all of the lawyers. See you around. And so the time for the gods to leave Midgard comes and Freya tells everyone with their heavy hearts they must leave. However, they must all know this. Lords and ladies of Broxton shall always have gods in their service. So swears Freya, the All-Mother. But rather than leave them with mere promises, please accept these gifts as a token of their eternal gratitude. Gold from the treasures of Asgard, enchanted fruit trees that will bloom for a thousand years, and a fountain that will never run dry. May the light of the Bifrost shine forever in their skies. As the gods all walk back to Asgard, a little girl from before asks if they're really leaving. They didn't fix the town. Where will they go? That was their home. A voice then calls out, stating, Aye, and may it always be. Thor flies down, placing a giant piece of stone down, and he tells everyone that he will not give back what they've lost. But this may serve as a small token of debt that was owed by Thor and the gods. The little girl looks up at the giant castle, and the little girl asks, She gets to live in that? And Thor tells her, If you so wish, yes. Rosalind asks Freya, did Thor just rip out a chunk of Asgard and give it away? Can he even do that? She smiles, stating that it is Bill Skirner, greatest of all the halls in Asgard. Rosalind says, okay, right, so whose castle was that? And Freya says that, who do you think it belonged to? It was Thor's. And so the gods of Asgard return once more to the heavens, though far less alone than when they arrived. Just as Earth itself will never be alone, so long as there is thunder in the sky. And back in the future, a new river has been forged, and Frigg asks, what shall they name this one? King Thor tells her, Roz. And Atli says, Roz, Jane, Steve. What kind of names are those for rivers? King Thor says that they are the unforgettable kind. Now come, children. We have much work to do. We have an entire world to regrow. Elsewhere, though, on a planet once known as Mars, Galactus readies himself to feast on another dead world, one that King Thor has allowed him to have. As he digs into the planet's core, he says that if it wasn't for that damned black weapon, but at least now the weapon is destroyed. However, there is something beneath the planet's surface, something dark. And as the darkness overcomes Galactus, he laughs, laughs as hard as his hollow face can. For what has just been born was the Butcher of Worlds. And so begins a story for another day.
And there you have it, the conclusion to the Thor God Butcher full storyline video. We're also going to be bringing you the female Thor storyline, which comes very shortly after this as a full story. And then we're going to be prepping into War of the Realms. So you got a lot of stuff coming here at Comic Storian. So if you want more of this, please consider subscribing to our channel. And don't forget, we are also Twitch streamers. You can find us most nights at twitch.tv slash monster, playing various games from MMOs to survival games to whatever's popular right now. Hope to see you there.